Hey guys, it's Nick. Welcome to another episode of Team Minus 365. Today's episode, we're going through the exciting updates from Microsoft in June of 2024. For those of you that you've never watched, I cover mostly the updates that are relevant to the MSP space, blocking out the noise from the hundred or so announcements that come from Microsoft each month. For those of you that don't know me, I'm a Microsoft MVP and creating content here in the channel for MSPs for the better part of a decade. As always, I link a blog post down below with helpful information and links to all the announcements that I'm going to cover here that span across your traditional Microsoft 365 apps and Intune and Copilot and even Defender. So we cover a lot in these uh, sessions here, but I want to make sure you guys have supplemental material to check out the announcements that mean the most to you as well. So as always, like and subscribe to the channel if you want to see more content around Microsoft and the MSP space. Otherwise, let's go ahead and dive in. Just a quick announcement before we get into the updates here, I'm really excited to announce the soft launch of an application that I've been working on called Cloud Capsule, which automates your Microsoft 365 security assessments against the CIS controls. Many of you out there have either consumed my CIS self-service checklist or the ebook that I wrote where I map all the Microsoft 365 controls to the CIS standards so they can have a framework to follow with a bunch of enablement content. I wanted to take that up a notch and really say you have an automated tool to run an assessment against the Microsoft tenant and really get back the values as far as the pass fail with the evidence behind those as well too. So that's all within the app across IG1 through IG3. You can see that and see that mapping after you run a tenant just takes a few minutes to set up and it also looks for deviations or misconfigurations either at a user level device level policy level so you can get ahead of improving your attack surface as well too so definitely check it out i'll link it in my blog post and on this video as well too it's free to run an assessment there and you can check it out and just see what it looks like and get a feel for the kinds of information that you're presented with but i would highly encourage that you take a look at that if you're looking to level up in your security assessments. Okay, so diving in here, we have a lot of great announcements this month, so definitely stay tuned for all of them here. We're going to start off with Teams as we usually do. This first one's related to detecting and hiding inactive channels. So this is something that Microsoft's going to do by default for inactive channels within Teams, and they're just going to hide it from users, which I can quickly see becoming a support desk call for us out there. But effectively, it does give them this notification, as you can see here in the screenshot, and then it will hide that. They can unhide that pretty easily. It's not something they can't overcome, but it is something that you should probably be aware of if you get those help desk calls coming through. Timelines for this one will be mid-August to be complete by mid-September. Next one here, if you're familiar with the files tab and your chat messages, that's where you have all of your storage for files that are shared in that chat or a group chat or whatnot. And this is something that is going to evolve and the name's gonna be changed to shared. But as you can see in this screenshot, it's also including more functionality like giving you recent files you've either shared or been working on, the actual files and a complete other section here, and then links that you've shared as well too. So any web links, anything like that, any document links, that will be stored in this location as well too. You can expect that mid-July be complete by late July. Next one here, if you use progressive web apps, PWA apps, um, you especially use it for Microsoft Teams, the new Microsoft Teams is going to support this now for Windows and Mac OS. If you don't know what PWA is, probably not important to you, but it is supported on Edge and Chrome, so you can get that today if that's something you're interested in. Shifting into more of the admin functionality here for Teams premium consumers. Again, this is a step up in licensing, more of a premium paid offering for advanced functionality within Teams. If you wanna see your ROI against that in usage, this is a new report you can consume within the Teams admin center and see the individual um, feature sets that are being consumed by the users in your organization so you can understand what adoption looks like. This will happen late July and be complete by early August. Next one here is a notification setting that you can use now as extending from what we had in the past being on channels and individual teams as well too, where you can actually turn off notifications at an individual post level. This is helpful if you don't want to get all that noise coming from a bunch of people commenting on a single post. This will happen mid-July and be complete by late July. 
Next one here is very formal, so it's informational in nature. Channel cards here, you can quickly hover over a channel, get a quick synopsis of what it's about, description, sensitivity labels, as well as recent activity. This will happen early July and be complete by late July. Next one here is also related to notification preferences here. This is giving users more granular control over the sound effects or the chimes that they hear whenever certain messages come through Teams. So you can see some of those here in the dropdown for the sound effects themselves. But if you're a user that doesn't want to be, be triggered as much by just that general Teams chime that I think triggers a lot of us who are on Teams a lot, um, you can mix it up here so maybe you only react to certain chimes that may be very sensitive in nature to you or important for your job. Um, timelines for this one is mid-July and be complete by late July. Shifting into Outlook here, the next one here for many of us will be very important. We use this a lot for call scheduling and meeting scheduling within Outlook. This is the legacy experience that you're seeing here in the screenshot, but they're going to update this to make it more comprehensive for our users. So if we see that, you know, we're looking at clicking on find the time, and then it's going to suggest those times to show you all the individual users who are available versus maybe available and tentative, things like that that you can see here as well. So just an easier way to schedule out your meetings and find those slots quickly. And this spans obviously across people in different time zones as well too. This will happen early July and be complete by late July. Next one here is the send updates to only added or removed meeting attendees. This is just giving you more options and granular control. Whenever you have an existing meeting, you add an attendee, you want to add messages, you can either include them or everybody that's on that meeting invite, um, if that makes sense. And so this will happen late July and be complete by late August. Last one here is nice for admins. I think it's a nice benefit to end user configuration for the native mail app that's going to be on Windows 11 devices. This is giving you the ability if you leverage something like Intune today for MDM management to automatically configure your accounts for Microsoft Outlook using Active Directory primary SMTP address. So that's your email address that they would manually be entering before to start that configuration. It will automatically be populated. If you follow those steps, links to that are on my blog. This will happen mid-June, be complete by early July. This next one here for many of us out there leveraging new Outlook that have a lot of frustrations about legacy functionality not being added in. This is something I think they're carrying over here where you can add shared folders to your favorites and you'll be able to see it here on the left-hand panel like you can in the screenshot. This will happen mid-November, so we still got some time for this one and be complete by early December. Shifting into our core Microsoft 365 apps, this first one here is just related to our files that we're accessing in a browser. And this is giving users a new experience here that's a little less clunky than what you're experienced with. If you're familiar with this today, if you go to file, it takes you to a different section um, within that application and you have all those settings kind of sprawled across and it's been, I think, from the feedback Microsoft got, a pretty clunky experience. So they're giving you this new experience where it's just a drop down menu, have a much more consolidated list of the most common action items, I think, that you would take against a Word doc or PowerPoint doc. Um, this is going to happen early August and be complete by early October. Next one here is related to consumers of things like Azure Information Protection or sensitivity labels. This is giving a little bit better UI around that that's more readily consumable, I think, to the typical end user where it's really outlaying the permissions in more human readable format. If you haven't experienced Azure Rights Management or sensitivity label application to documents for protections, um, then you don't probably understand the value here, but this is a lot cleaner in what it's describing to the user about what protections they're putting against the document. This will happen early September, be complete by late September. Next one here is the ability to set expiration availability links for when you're sharing documents with internal um, users to your organization. Previously, this capability actually was only existing on links that were anyone links. So you could set an expiration date, which is definitely security best practice, but they're extending that to the internal users as well. I think that's really important for data sensitivity and just overall data governance. This will happen early July, be complete by mid July. Next one here for all of our Excel users out there, uh, they're introducing a quick way to add checkboxes into your Excel sheets. For many of you, this might be an amazing feature that we had, you know, something in the past that we could do to do this, but it was a little bit more hidden, but this is available now or will be available in the insert section of Excel. 
and the timelines on this starting in June 26th specifically, they're beginning to roll out. But if you don't see it yet, you can expect that to be done. And in your environment, if you've been updating your Outlook or sorry, your Excel apps uh, by the end of July. Shifting into Microsoft Intune here. This first one here, I think is a great security update here for device attestation. And this is allowing you to leverage things like the TPM um, within the device so that it's hardware attested. And this is primarily for Windows devices today, but they're extending that attestation across Mac OS, Android, and iOS as well too in the future. This is in a preview right now, so you may see it in your platform. It may take some time before that shows up, but definitely something that you can do to help look at compliant devices, right, within your organization. This other one here I thought was really big as well too. So typically when you have either GPOs pushing out or you have the MDM policies pushing out, really this policy CSP setting, um, by default, it's syncing on an eight hour interval. So it's really kind of hard to understand, you know, when, when things are pushing out, if it's at every eight hours. So this policy in and of itself, whenever you're creating these profiles and saying that we're gonna set the re refresh settings here, you can set it as low as 30 minutes. So every 30 minutes, it would kind of check in and do that. Just know it's not for everything, it's for the policy CSP settings. So you have to keep that in mind when you're rolling this out. And it does only apply, I think, today to the Windows 11 devices. So definitely check it out. Um, GA today, you can look at it within the Intune Admin Center. Shifting into Copilot here, this first one is introducing a new catch-up feature. This is in both the Microsoft 365 Copilot app, if you go to office.com or microsoft365.com chat, um, and also within Teams, if you click on the Copilot icon, it's on the top of your left-hand nav. And this is just giving you a carousel of cards based off of recent interactions that you've had with your email, with documents, with meetings. So it's interesting. I haven't gotten this yet personally. We use Copilot. So um, not something I've seen yet, but this is supposed to be rolled out um, at least by the late July timeframe. The other thing they did here, I don't know why personally, but extended availability for Copilot. So we always had this limitation, right? And we've slowly been expanding to all SKUs, but when Copilot first came out, we had limitations against what base plans you could attach this to. And a lot of that made sense to me because you're not going to get the ROI or value add if you are, for instance, just looking at Exchange Online Plan 1. You just have a mailbox. And you're, I know you're getting to say that you could use Copilot for your mailbox. But my opinion is that somebody who's paying $4 a month for a mailbox only is not going to bolt on a $30 a month prepaid annual product. Uh, so that's my opinion, uh, but you know, basically they're extending the availability of what you can bolt on Copilot to to anything. Next one here is just optimized file link support for the Teams chat and channels. So previous to this, um, you didn't have as much optimization around the actual deep links for the references for the files. As you can see here, they're all referenced as part of the chat um, that you would have with Copilot as part of a meeting. Um, and even in a channel as well too. So this will happen mid-July, be complete by late July. Next one here, I do recognize this one. Me personally, I've had a lot of mixed responses when I prompt Copilot for specific actions in specific timeframes. So this is just giving it a better understanding of how to respond to time-based queries in chat messages. And you can see the before and after here where it's really you know taking the same query in, but it's able to provide a summary of the simplified timestamp there of the time frame, and maybe is a little bit more accurate in the actual responses that it gives. Something for me that's very important because it seems to be all over the place in the sense of what messages I get back and what it thinks are important. This will happen mid-July and be complete by late July. Next one here is support for referencing PDF files in PowerPoint. So previous to this, you could only reference a Word document, say, hey, create me a, a PowerPoint doc out of this Word document. And now they're extending that also. It's able to scan a PDF file, which is pretty cool. Um, timelines for this one will be late May, be complete by mid-June. So by the time you're watching this, hopefully already out, you can test that out with a PDF in PowerPoint. And this other one here uh, was a big controversial feature that's part of the Copilot plus PC announcements, Microsoft's new piece of hardware. That's really uh, impressive in the sense of its capabilities, but it had this feature called recall, if you're not familiar, that was basically taking snapshots of your device every couple of seconds. And it was a huge privacy issue that they just completely kind of 
overlooked uh, in the sense of the PR behind it. So now they've kind of retroactively gone back and said, hey, we're not going to turn this on by default. You'll have the option to turn it on if you want when you boot up the device, but it's going to stay off by default as well too. So just overcoming that, but it was funny to see um, just given that it did cause a bit of an uproar. Last section here is for the admins out there. Some of these are security settings, some of these are just productivity announcements, but first one here is related to DKIM. I like this one just because it's introducing you to DKIM more natively throughout your experience and specifically upon your domain addition within a tenant. Previously, this wasn't in there, didn't make sense. I think they should have all of these in there with SPF, DMARC, and DKIM just for basic D, uh, email authentication health. And this will improve the security of your tenant greatly as well, in my opinion. But this is giving you these settings here so that you can enable DKIM, get the records that you would need um, for your, your DNS settings. Um, but also within the Exchange Admin Center or the Defender Center, you also have more of a simplified approach to enabling DKIM as well for your custom domains. Um, so this will happen mid-June, be complete by mid-July. And then the next one here, for those of us on NC, MSPs, transferring between partners, as in you acquire a company, you want to get their business over from the losing MSP or whatnot, or maybe they're direct, whatever it might be. Um, now you have this experience of partner to partner subscription transfers for new commerce, and this is allowing you to transfer midterm from one partner to another. So that is giving you some flexibility there on conversion without having to have that linger or as an MSP more so, you should be relieved that you don't have the financial liability if the customer leaves you, right? That's probably bigger for a lot of us out there. You will have to talk with your distributor to see if they support this yet while it's live from Microsoft. Distributors are the one, if you're working with them like a PAX 8, for instance, you'll have to see if they're supporting as well too. And then the next one is related to the introduction of the Microsoft Entre PowerShell module. So this is related to also like the deprecation we've seen with the Azure AD module, the MS Online module that many of us use for many years um, to run PowerShell within Microsoft. They're shifting us to Entre. Have some links in there to see how it corresponds with Graph um, PowerShell as well. This is a public preview. You can check it out and start to run some of the commandlets. What you need to update, you know, from those legacy modules, if you still have scripts that use those legacy functions. And then the last one here is a new public preview of a new conditional access setting that requires token protection. I think this one's really cool. I'm really happy Microsoft got into this here, and there's definitely a lot of expansion they can do for token protection for things like man in the middle attacks. I've been making a lot of videos lately about this, so definitely check those out if you haven't already. But this is specifically for Exchange and SharePoint today that you can use where it ties a um, primary refresh token to a device that you're on that hopefully is a managed device, trusted device. And then if a token is used on another device, that same token is used on a different device and you use this setting, it'll automatically uh, block the user from entering that session, which should prevent things like the evil jinx attack, right? As an example of that. So definitely something you could check out. Don't ever recommend putting things into production that are in preview from Microsoft, but at least testing it out, seeing how it works. Um, it's a good protection. I hope they expand this into web cookies as well here too in the future. Okay, guys, that's everything I had for you today. Definitely comment below with the features or functionality you're most excited about. As always, like and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already to get more content around Microsoft and the MSP space. I'll see you guys next week.